Oh, good morning, everybody, and good morning to everyone that's watching on whatever technological device you may have. This morning, we're continuing our series in Revelation, and it's Revelation chapter 2, verses 18 to 29, concerning the city of Thyatira, which was a compromised church. And Father, we've just sang that to get a touch from the Lord is so real. And Lord, we pray this morning as we go through your word that we do get a touch from you. And I pray that everything that's said this morning brings glory to your name. Amen. To the scripture, this is the New King James Version. And to the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These things, says the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire and his feet like fine brass, I know your works, love, service, faith, and your patience. And as for your works, the last are more than the first. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you because you allow that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. And I gave her time to repent of her sexual immorality, and she did not repent. Indeed, I will cast her into a sick bed and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation, unless they repent of their deeds. I will kill her children with death and all the churches shall know that I am he who searches the minds and the hearts. And I will give to each one of you according to your works. Now to you I say, and to the rest in Thyatira, as many as do not have this doctrine, who have not known the depths of Satan, as they say, I will put on you no other burden. But hold fast what you have till I come. And he who overcomes and keeps my works until the end, to him I will give power over the nations. He shall rule them with a rod of iron. They shall be dashed to pieces like the potter's vessels, as I also have received from my Father. And I will give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Thyatira, the city, was situated on the river Hermas in the west of what is now Asiatic Turkey. It's 61 kilometres from Pergamos and 51 kilometres from Sardis. And the city was located in the northern part of the province known as Lydia in the Roman province of Asia and it bordered Mycenae on the north and Lydia on the south. Thyatira is a Greek word which means daughter and it's got its name in 290 BC in honour of the birth of King Cellulus I, Nicator's daughter. He was named Thyatira. The modern name of the ancient Thyatira is Achissa, which means a white-coloured castle. It was a prosperous trading town, an important location on the Roman road from Pergamos to Laodicea. That's the north-south Roman road. As such, it was in a strategic position and it was a frontier military garrison. Firstly for the Seleucids, secondly for the Romans when they took over. The city hosted a major cult of the pagan god Apollo. The city was famous for the dyeing of cloth and was a centre of the indigo trade. It was also famous for its fine brassware. The trade guilds in Thyatira and for guild reed unions 
for which the city was well known, were more organised and far greater in number than in other ancient Asia Minor cities. The Romans didn't like them. They didn't like these organised unions because they used to cause them trouble. But they tolerated them in Thyatira because it was such a... Uh, what do I call it? A prosperous city that supplied both the Roman garrison there and the Roman garrison at Pergamon, particularly with instruments of brass. As far as the uh, Dyer's Union was concerned, evidence suggests they made use of the batter route for making purple cloth, purple dye. Now the key to that is every artisan in Thyatira was a member of a guild. If you weren't a member of the union, you couldn't operate. It was as simple as that. Why are you smiling? If you're not a member of the union, you can't operate. So if you're a coppersmith, you had to be at the coppersmith's union. It was as simple as that. And these guilds or unions were incorporated organisations. They could own property in their own name and they could enter into contracts for construction business. As such, you can imagine, they wielded a very significant influence. And as I've mentioned, the two most powerful were the coppersmiths and the dyers. During his second missionary journey, the Apostle Paul travelled to Philippi. On a Sabbath day, he meets a woman named Lydia from Thyatira, and she's praying near a river. Lydia was a seller of purple, either the dye or the cloth, dyed in this colour. She listens to Paul's preaching and becomes so convicted in God's way of life that she, along with her entire household, are baptised. And it's possible that when she returned to Thyatira that she helped to spread the gospel throughout the city. Now, like a lot of ancient cities, there's a few ruins around the place. Thyatira, there's not a lot of ancient ruins. It's pretty much been taken over by the modernisation of the location. And the location, in terms of the rest of it, you can see there towards the top, you've got Pergamum, then Thyatira, then down to Sardis, Philadelphia, Laodicea. That's the north-south Roman road, follows those cities. And the east-west road actually runs through Laodicea across to Ephesus. Now, as I mentioned, these unions were very powerful. If you were a coppersmith, you had to belong to the coppersmith's union or you couldn't operate. Now, that didn't create a problem for most people, but it created a problem for Christians. Because when they attended the union meetings, they were actually religious worship of the God of the coppersmiths. And it involved eating meat that was sacrificed to the idol and their meetings usually finished up in uh, orgies and various forms of debauchery. Now that's a problem for a Christian. Ah, but Jezebel had an answer. We'll get to her in shortly. Now like all of the seven letters, there is a structure, not necessarily in this order, Oops, I've missed one somewhere. Yes, I did. Come on, quick, Beryl. I want that one. All of the letters have those six elements. There's a description of Christ, his evaluation of the church, 
his criticism of the church where necessary, his advice to the church, his praise if any, and then encouragement to the overcomers about their eternal future. Now particularly in terms of Thyatira, we see the description of Christ. To the angel of the church of Thyatira write, These things says the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire and his feet like fine brass. It's quite likely that the angel refers to the senior elder, missionary, pastor, bishop, whatever you like to call him, but the senior officer of the church. And he's charged with the oversight of and responsibility for the church in Thyatira. These things, says the Son of God, immediately distinguishes the speaker as opposed to Apollo or some of the lesser gods of the city. This is the son of the living God speaking, not one of the Greek gods. The description of his dress may represent armour made of burnished bronze, which was a particular burnished brass, a particular pro popular product of the city. Particularly with Roman officers, they loved to have bright and shining armour. It was different to what they wore in battle. This was dress armour. It's like you have a dress uniform. For anybody that's ever been in the military, you have a dress uniform, or even the police. We had a dress uniform. And it was quite different to the uniform that you wore to work. Well, so they did too, and they would have a... a a breastplate and armour plates and all the rest of it down around the thighs and that made of uh, polished brass. And that was made of Thyatira. The eyes of fire. Well, you don't get fine brass if you don't have fire. And it's a pretty hot fire. From memory, I think it's about 1300 degrees centigrade. Now, we don't have any trouble getting that today, but they'd have had a bit of trouble in those days getting it up to that. But they, they used, uh, as near as we can figure, they used somewhat similar to what our blacksmiths do. They had bellows on the side. And as they pumped across and the coals got hotter and hotter and hotter until it melted the, uh, the necessary metals to make brass. Eyes of fire also represents righteous anger. His evaluation of the church. I know your works, love, service, faith and your patience. And as for your works, the last are more than the first. This is a church that's going places. They're doing better now than what they did when they first started. And as far as Christ was concerned, there's no question concerning their love, their faith, their service and their faith. However, he says, I have a few things against you because you allow that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. The church had allowed a dangerous ministry to operate in their midst. Jezebel is probably a symbolic name calling to mind the evil queen of King Ahab of Israel. The real Jezebel was a princess from Sidon who became the wife of Ahab, the king of Israel, and she brought gross corruption into the northern kingdom with her introduction of Baal worship. She was a very attractive and beautiful woman, apparently, but one steeped in evil. Corruption had actually started in the northern kingdom under Jeroboam I when he put uh, calves at, Baal, uh, at uh, Dan and Bethel. 
but she brought in this whole new form of worship which involved, because Baal was also the god of fertility, it involved sexual practices, ritual prostitution if you like was a form of worship. There are some commentators who believe that this woman called Jezebel was the wife of the angel of the church, but that's purely speculation. There's nothing in scripture or in church history to support that speculation. She was probably following the teaching of the Nicolaitans. They were libertarian Gnostics who believed that Christ was merely spirit. In other words, he was never fully God and fully man. You see, in their teaching, spirit is good and pure. Anything material is bad, it's evil. So, if, God was, if Jesus was merely spirit and had never been human, he couldn't possibly be human because as spirit, he was perfect and pure and good. If he'd been man, that would have been material and evil. And how could he possibly be pure and evil at the same time? That was their line of thinking. Consequently, leading on from that, because your spirit was always pure and good, it didn't matter what you did in the body because that didn't affect the spirit. In other words, go out, live life, do what you want to do. It doesn't matter because your spirit is always pure. Yet yeah, we know that's not right. But that was what they taught. So you can see how by introducing that line of thinking into the church, that was the out for the Christians who were coppersmiths or dyers or whatever and couldn't operate unless they were a member of the union. They could go along and engage in everything that went on and it didn't matter because their spirit was still pure. Can you see how that teaching is wrong? But that's the sort of teaching she brought in. No wonder Jesus had that against her. She's leading people astray. And no doubt we find that today there are some libertarian people around who while they mightn't teach you go out and worship Apollo and all that sort of stuff, they still say, oh well, it's greasy grace. Do what you like and come back and say, oh well Lord, uh, I did this and I did that but thank you for forgiving me. That's greasy grace. That's not what it's about at all. Yes, we do have forgiveness for things that we do wrong but not when you deliberately go out and commit things that are wrong and then just come back and say, oh, well, Lord, you know, thank you for forgiving me. And there's no repentance. There's no change of behaviour. There's no change of attitude. No change of thinking. And so we have to be careful that we do not compromise the truth on the basis of corruption that's brought into the church, let's say by attractive people whose intentions are evil. We should not allow our judgment to be perverted because the person who's proposing it is either physically attractive or charismatic in personality. All practices need to be tested against scripture and the scripture needs to be rightly divided. And you will find that if you rightly divide the scripture, you will find the same principle will appear time and time and time again throughout the scripture. God gave Jezebel a time to change. She didn't. I'd suggest that that indicates that she'd been a believer who'd gone off the rails. So we need to judge ourselves as well so that we don't fall into, this, into errors. 
And some say, oh, well, the errors are always excesses. Yes, but sometimes error comes through conservatism. And you become so conservative, you get legalistic. And that's not right either. Anyway, Jesus then comes with the advice to the church. Now to you I say, and to the rest in Thyatira, as many as do not have this doctrine, who have not known the depths of Satan as they say, I will put on you no other burden, but hold fast what you have till I come. That's an exhortation to those who haven't fallen into this trap of the libertarian Gnostic uh, beliefs. You see, the doctrine of Jezebel is a serious because it separates those who will and will not be disciplined. And there is a promise of no further pressures coming on those who remain faithful, and that comes from Acts 15, 28 and 29. For it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things, that you abstain from things offered to idols, from blood, from things strangled, and from sexual immorality. If you keep yourselves from these, you will do well. And of course, the Lord will not tolerate anybody having other gods. We know that from Exodus 20. You shall have no other gods before me. So Jesus is telling the church and telling us, hold fast to what is pure and true. Hold to New Testament truth rather than false and counterfeit doctrine. The Lord then restates that he's coming back for his church. Of course, be it the rapture. We should eagerly await the return of the Lord for his bride. And the truth and the reality of his return should be great comfort. As far as praise is concerned, well, the Lord has already praised the church in his opening evaluation. He said this was a church that's going places, but it had been corrupted by false teaching. Nevertheless, there was praise for those who had not succumbed to false doctrine. Then comes encouragement to overcomers. And he who overcomes and keeps my works until the end, to him I will give power over the nations. And then quoting from the enthronement psalm, Psalm 2, verses 8 and 9, He shall rule them with a rod of iron. They shall be dashed to pieces like the potter's vessels as I also have received from my Father, and I will give him the morning star. The overcomer will have a part in the messianic kingdom and will share in the rulership over the nations. The word translated power can also be rendered privilege or authority. And it's of interest to me anyway, that the millennial kingdom, according to this verse, will consist of nations and not an international conglomerate. There will still be nations, tribes and nations. You see, true power to do the will of God comes from God. We have no authority other than what is given us by the Lord. That promise of enthronement celebrated the promise to David and pointed to his seed who would rule over the nations that sought to rebel against him. In other words, it's a messianic psalm. It is noted that the word translated uh, as rod can also be translated as scepter. And if you notice that uh, most 
ruling royals, when they're in their full regalia, they have something that looks like a, a donger, that's the rod, and the other that looks like a crook, that's the shepherd's crook. The king or the queen is supposed to be the shepherd of their people. And even in parliament, when they carry the scepter in to lay it on the end of the table, that's known as the black rod. It's a great big waddy about that law with a big donger on the end of it. So there's a lot of these sort of things that we even have in our practices today that come from Scripture. Revelation declares that Jesus Christ is greater than the most powerful emperor the world has ever known. And the promise is that the overcomer will have the morning star. Now in Revelation 22:16, Christ himself is declared to be the morning star. So as Christians, we have and will continue to have the reality of the morning star, the reality of Jesus. The possession of the true faith presupposes a possession of the person of Christ. But there is another interpretation that would have rung very true to the early Christians in Thyatira which relates to the morning star. The morning star is Venus. For the Romans, that star was a symbol of victory and sovereignty. Roman generals would build temples to Venus and the Roman army had the symbol of Venus inscribed on the standards of every legion. Remember, Thyatira is a frontier Roman military garrison. And so, when Jesus said, give to the morning star, he's not only saying you have myself, he says I'm giving you victory as the Romans declare victory, something that they could grab hold of, something they recognised. So the overcomer is doubly assured of participation with Christ in his triumph and in his rule. So they've got something they can grab hold of in the natural if you like. And they also have the promise of Christ. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. That's not talking about the lugs that you have on the side of your head. Most of us have two. That's what you hear, if you've still got hearing. That's what you hear in the natural. And you can hear words, but do you hear the Spirit in the words? That's why Jesus says, let him that hath an ear hear what the Spirit has to say. It's what the Lord is saying to us through his word. It's the spiritual ear is the one that matters. Yes, you hear it with your natural ear, but do you get it in the spirit? Do you hear it with the spiritual ear? He that hath an ear, hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Amen. Father, we pray that we always have our minds and our hearts open so that we do hear what the Spirit has to say to the churches. And Lord, that what is said to the churches of long ago is just as applicable to us today. We thank you, Lord, that you give us the revelation for us today as was intended for those churches of long ago. And that may we bring glory to your name. Amen.